Sunday the 3rd of November 2019. I wanted to go over some of the other quarterly reports that have come out of the ASX gold stocks in the last couple of weeks. I think in the last video maybe only a few of the companies had, had released uh, quarterlies or sort of preliminary production numbers. Uh, so I thought I'd go over some of the main main ones that people are interested in. In the last video I was uh, pretty harsh on Resolute Gold um, and I continue to be sort of pretty skeptical about some of the stuff they've come out with since. I think in the video they, they were talking about, um, in the last video I talked about they'd done a, uh, Sayama had, had issues with the roaster and it was coming offline and um, they needed to work out a fix. So that was this, this down day here in uh, the early October and the stock went down sort of 10 or 12% I think that day. Uh, you know, and since then, uh, two weeks later, they've come out with a result saying that they're going to leave their production guidance unchanged. And when I saw that, I just I couldn't quite really believe it, uh, considering they were already it already looked like they were going to struggle to meet their production numbers, even if the roaster didn't have an issue. So I was a bit bit uh, perplexed by that. And the stock rallied very well on that day. It was up probably eight or ten percent. But you can see that it was sold into pretty heavily in the days after that. And I think that shows the market was pretty skeptical of that, um, sticking to that production forecast. And I, when I listened to the quarterly result on, uh, which came out on Thursday, I think, or Friday, and, uh, you know, I was reading through this, and they had here, there's a couple of things that stood out to me. One was this, uh, you know, Maker had a very good quarter under in uh, the first quarter of full ownership. Um, and if you look down at the production numbers here, you can see that, because they acquired Mako uh, only in, in the at the start of August, so they didn't get July, they didn't have ownership of Mako until second uh, of August. But it seems as though Mako didn't draw, uh, didn't pour any gold in July. So there was all this gold in circuit that you know um, Resolute was just able to produce from at the start of August once they acquired ownership. So effectively, they get all the benefit of that. Obviously, they have to account for the costs of producing that gold. But in their, their quarterly numbers, um, everything else was extremely high. So uh, Sayama Sulphide had a, a blowout number there. That's that's obviously because of they, they're still producing very low levels. And because they've declared commercial production, now they have to declare everything. So on a, on a per ounce basis, it's it's ridiculously high. Um, even the oxide was was quite high for, a, um, for the volumes they're getting there. But um, you can see Mako was very low, you know, 1,000 Australian dollars, 716 US is very good. But the thing is, because of that, that uh, 16,000 ounces that they get the extra benefit of, it, it really dragged down the average. So I did a, did a few numbers um, and found that if you, if you accounted for, if you didn't account for those, the first 32 days of production, so they didn't, if this gold was poured and, um, you know, Resolute didn't, didn't get the benefit of that in these fig in this all in sustaining cost figure. The true uh, all in sustaining cost was 1,900 Australian dollars an ounce. So they were basically making no money. Um, and in fact, if you if you dig down even further in here, you'll see that the the because um, obviously they took on a lot of debt for uh, to buy to buy um, Toro. And now the total debt figure they've got is about I think it's almost 400 million dollars. Um, Australian and net debt. So that that's a pretty a pretty large figure. Um, the fact that I have to stro scroll down through everything here to find the the net debt, debt figure also sort of annoys me a little bit. And I think it's part of the way Resolute Report is there's a lot of info and they always put the good stuff up the top and you have to dig in to find the, the bad bits. And that's always a warning sign for me. I, I want the companies to be pretty open and honest. I mean, they're obviously honest, but you want to be able to find it easily and not have to, it's a, it's a bit of a warning sign. But you can see there, they're $530 million of borrowings. Uh, they got $150 million in cash. And I think they're going to be burning another probably 30 or $40 million next quarter. It wouldn't surprise me. And they said they're looking to restructure this debt. Um, so, yeah, it's I, I've been talking about this. as There's plenty of warning signs here, and I've just had it as an avoid, and I continue to have it as an avoid. They've said this, this roaster problem, they're looking to fix that early to mid-December. Um, and that's, you know, I, I don't... don't um, really want to rely on sort of complex engineering projects coming in on time for them to hit their production guidance. But the main thing, I think they're, um, they're relying on the sulfur, the uh, cyanide oxide circuit to outperform again. I'm trying to find the spot. 
So this bit here is that this is really what's going to, um, you can see here there's been a sort of a decline in grade after they had those sort of blowout grades on the sodium oxide in the, the first part of the year. Gradual decline. But they're talking about this, they're going to get some of these, you know, um, excellent grades again, I think, in this from this pit they've just started mining from. So, you know, maybe that is enough to boost the grade. And I think when I listen to the quarterly, I think they're still, they're looking for, about 40,000 plus ounces out of the um, about of the ox out of the oxide circuit again. So that's that's what's going to deliver them their production guidance. And if they don't hit that figure out of, out of the oxide, I can't see them uh, delivering enough out of uh, Mako and Ravenswood to make up for the shortfall from the uh, it's a sulfide circuit. So I'd be pretty uh, cautious about owning the stock, and I, the chart's really telling you that. Uh, it's just been in the too hard basket for a while, and I'm not sure why. It's just not worth the effort, and I think that's one of the things. Like the first few stocks I'm going to talk about now, and I'll move on to St. Barbara. Is sometimes it's just not worth owning these stocks at certain points, and the, and the companies give you the reasons why, you know, and, and particularly with technical problems uh, and concerns about mine life and um, you know ongoing viability of, of mines. It's really not a good idea to sort of fight those trends, and you need to wait till they're uh, sorted out. I mean, the, the, obviously the contrarian is, oh, well, that's where the best buying is. But um, I think there's still often there's a lag between uh, you can still fight. It's still a good opportunity to buy and you can still wait for that technical risk to kind of die down and find that that moment. But Resolute and St. Barbara have both been in that category for a while. Um, I thought that the St. Barbara uh, quarterly, again, was pretty, pretty poor. Um, and they, they, they've been waiting on this project um, to free up more uh, ventilation to finish and then they can open up more mining mining areas and I think increase uh, tonnages through the mill so they're or increase the uh, the mine tonnages sorry so they, their mill is under under um, they're not don't, don't can't supply the ore ore to the mill currently that they need to keep uh, production going at a, for, at good run rates uh, so that, that project's not due to be finished for another sort of, in the next three to six months, it's kind of, will be finished. So potentially that's the time to buy the stock. I think the December quarter will still be pretty poor. Um, but you know, they had had to downgrade their, their guidance for Gualia as well. So again, that was sort of predictable that it was, it was going to be a poor quarter and it was just not a good time to own it. And the chart tells you that, you know, that this was... It was clearly in a, in, a, in a bit of a downtrend. They had that big, pro the big problems in March. Um, we've got the Atlantic acquisition as well. I think that's probably been that was seemed to be an okay result for there. So I'm not not too concerned about that. Even though I think they overpaid for that asset, that's kind of water under the bridge, and eventually the market will forget about it. But um, Guali is sort of the focus at the moment, and it's not not doing that well. Um, the other one in the sort of the had the poor result was Northern Star. And this is another one where the chart's kind of telling you a story. There's sort of a broader trend here, and amongst the uh, the Australian gold developers, uh, gold producers, the big, the big sort of large or mid to large cap stocks, um, they're all in fair, a bit of a an ex growth phase now, where they're struggling to get organic growth out of the operations, and they're having to invest quite heavily to to maintain production levels and costs. Costs are gradually increasing. Uh, Northern Star, I think they're they've kind of bitten off more they can more than they can chew with this Pogo acquisition in Alaska. Um, had a bit of a blowout quarter for co cost wise. Uh, you can see there, you know, losing a lot of cash there, 500 bucks an ounce US. Um, you know, and I think one thing that stood out to me was just the, the lack of cash flow in general from from Northern Star for a company that's pushing I think you know five or six billion dollar market cap to produce only 28 million. And even that, you know, that was obviously due to Pogo a lot, but still, still not a great result. Even if Pogo was, uh, you know, 16, 1700, it's not, it would have not been producing the amount of free cash flow that I would expect from a company of this, of that market cap. And everyone's got that sort of view that these guys are, are kind of gods and that they'll continue to, to be, uh, perform that way. But they've, you know, they're showing, starting to have a few missteps here. And I don't, I would have, haven't owned the stock for a while and I don't really want to, um, so they've sort of given away a lot of those gains uh, since June. And if you look at what happened when they bought Pogo, you know, had a, a surge uh, and that's showing like a, a bit market was getting ahead of itself. 
Um, and I, I was always concerned that you know the companies that that mine these assets are not stupid, and when they they sell them, they're not they've obviously got their own concerns. So that's for every for every transaction, there's a buyer and a seller. So Northern Star can't turn every asset around, and they did they did have um, Platonic where they they struggled and. And they were always very optimistic, and they were going to they were going to turn it around. It was always very bullish, and eventually they just got rid of it for, for next to nothing. So I don't think Pogo is in that category yet. And some of the underlying metrics do look quite good, but um, it's definitely you know now they're talking about they're going to apply an expansion. So that's a uh, calendar year 21, 21. So next year could be another poor year for Pogo. And I'm not sure if the market can really wait that long. Uh, you're just seeing a little bit of impatience here. So that's another stock where I was kind of avoid um, the one that I, I did want to own um, at this point was Perseus and I thought their their quarterly was was quite good um, another sort of decent uh, numbers coming out and a very sort of stable production at the moment good cash flow you see here that sort of you know cash flow of 30 million dollars US so they're you know more free cash flow than Northern Star which is a company you know, four or five times the market cap. So, um, and their their production sort of back ended. You can see here they've got a they're predicting a better half in the June half. So I, I'm you know I'm happy with that, and that's performed very well. It's probably been one of the better performers amongst sort of the the mid caps and back up at um, another five year high kind of level here. Um, you know, I'm not sure how much more there is in this. It is at a, a sort of now at a billion 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 one market cap Australian uh, so it's it's you know had a good good move here uh, I you know I could probably see upside to a dollar in the short term but um, you know after that it's going to probably be relying on the gold price and I think the gold price has really helped here you know that Australian dollar gold price being under a little bit of pressure US dollar gold price has looked very bullish um, the last the last couple of weeks and just sort of holding its levels and now sort of moving forward and the US dollar itself is kind of falling. Um, so that's helping the gold price. So Perseus still remains one of my better, sort of from a production stability point of view, I think is a good stock if you just want to play the gold price. Uh, whereas a lot of those other ones I've just talked about have their own sort of operational issues and I just don't want to, I don't have to worry about that in a rising gold price environment where you know you should be able to make money here. So you shouldn't want to, you don't have to worry about these production issues dragging you down and um, so I try and take the easy money as I guess is my my philosophy at the moment uh, the other one Regis had a, had a reasonably poor result as well I thought it was um, fairly high cost for them and also um, a lot of a lot of cash flow uh, going out on you know they've they got the, obviously always been a high dividend payer um, I think the cash flow waterfall here you know, so they had a decent cash flow from mines, but they, they're doing a lot of extra mining, developing new pits, underground mining as well. And then they've got their, um, their, their large dividend payment, which is, you know, they're a good dividend paying stock. So I, I'm, I'm, I like, and that's one of the reasons I like them, but this, they're in a bit of a sort of a, I guess, a heavy investment phase at the moment for the next, um, probably this quarter and, and next quarter. So what, when that's over, this probably return back to their, their, you know, good cash producing ways, but they also had some um, invested in uh, Dukedon mining, buying a lot of land around their existing plants. So that, that's sort of, I guess, future proofing and, and trying to get some good exploration results um, to increase the mine inventory. So they're doing well still, but I, you know, it's not, it's probably not in a perfect, not as good a spot as I would like. And you can see that another chart that's looking a pretty you know, seeing quite a bit of selling come in here on on Friday when the gold price jumped a bit. All these Australian uh, gold producers did try to run up, and they they all got sold down during the day. So it shows you the sort of a lack of conviction here, um, and they're running into that sort of quite heavy selling pressure after, you know, even only after small runs. Um, so I think they're most of these are pretty fully priced. Uh, I did buy read just sort of that 450, 460 range a few weeks ago. I think I talked about in the last video. So it's been a reasonable performance since then it's it's uh, but I'm not I'm not expecting huge upside here at the moment it's more of a long-term play and just um, they, they're generally a good cash producing company paying a good dividend so I'm happy to own them if the price dips to that level like the 450 which I thought was good value um, Saracen as well had a, probably that's the most most growth in it of any of the 
uh, larger ASX gold producers at the moment. Uh, and their quarterly was was uh, probably one of the better ones. Their their costs have dropped dramatically now, below a thousand dollars Australian an ounce. Um, and you know you can see there at Thunderbox they're below seven hundred, and they're producing a lot of uh, you know that's the best quarter ever. So I think they're going to see you're going to see a little bit of a, a trend of still lower costs and higher production for the next couple of quarters. Um, they're still having to invest in a lot of um, you know, new new mining areas around their existing plants as well. So they've, they've been doing a lot of investment in the last probably six months, buying out smaller producers nearby or smaller deposits. So I think that they've done very well, and I think they're, they've probably got a little bit extra um, production growth still coming, but they're reaching that point soon where they're going to be at the top of their, um, you know, their organic growth, I guess. So that's so then they might have to, a few of these companies might have to think outside the box a little bit. But that's, you can see again, it's sold down every time it's starting to rally in here. But there's a lot of fairly heavy uh, resistance level, probably around this 390 to 4 bucks. You can see a lot of red candles there, a lot of high wicks that are getting sold down. Um, so that sort of indicates that's kind of a bit of a a, um, a level at which the market thinks the stock's kind of getting a bit over overvalued. Um, you know, and I, I, I bought it uh, last video. I think I talked about that 320, 321. I think I got in, and I bought it again when it dipped down to the same level. I thought it was good value a few days before the quarterly, which I expected to be, to be good. So, I, I, I focus a lot on these quarterly reports because they do sh do set the sort of short term trends for these companies. Um, so I thought you know the Saracen would probably be going to be very decent given the some of the stuff in the previous one. So I was I was pretty happy with that result. Um, next one, probably uh, Medusa is a stock that I've talked about a few times. Their, their report came out, um, you know, it's a stock that's not getting a lot of love, partly because it doesn't follow the sort of broader production trends of a uh, broader gold market trends because it's sort of under, under owned and it's not represented in a lot of the indexes. It's only a $200 million market cap ish or even less, uh, you know, but the, just wanted to point out that they're, they, they, you know, this is a company of 150 million market cap that made almost 8 million US dollars last quarter. It increased their cash balance by 8 million US dollars on, you know, on 27,000 ounces. So that they're producing a lot of good cash flow here. Um, you know, a few sort of underlying trends that look reasonably positive, a bit more underground development. Uh, I'd like to see something happen with the, the management of the company. I think there's a bit of uh, potentially the AGMs coming up as well. Maybe they can the board can get shaken out, but even then, eventually, I think the market will pay attention to this cash build. And I think you can see here that they're they're one of the few companies that is fully unhedged, so they were able to take advantage of that gold price move. So, you know, they, their average price receives up almost to to fifteen hundred. So they'll keep they'll keep receiving that price in uh, at least for October. We've we've maintained those levels, so they're going to keep producing good cash uh, compared to some of these other Australian companies that are, that are hedged quite heavily. Mo a lot of them, probably about 40 to 50% of their uh, production for the next sort of 12 months is hedged. So that's that's one of the other reasons I like Medusa. Um, but, you know, the stock's doing very little on the chart. You know, there's, there's just no one paying attention, basically. But I, I expect that if the gold price keeps moving, eventually people will start moving into companies like this. Um, Gold Road had a, a very good quarter as well. I've been a bit skeptical about that. I thought it was uh, potentially overpriced, uh, and I, I still think it is. So I I didn't buy any, but I thought. But when the day the day the quarterly came out, um, the market didn't really react at all, which I thought was strange. Uh, and then the next day, so a big surge. I guess some of the broker reports came out. It was ahead of expectations, but the stock's already at that kind of fair value for me. So I didn't see, even though I thought it was probably a good buy there, I didn't think there was movement up to, to more than say $1.20. I think that's where it should be roughly. Um, if they're going to be a sort of 150,000 ounce producer you know, and making good good money, I don't think the stock's worth considerably more than that that $1.20 range. So that's why I didn't, didn't buy it. But it, it was a good, I think that removes sort of that last bit of uncertainty now that their ramp up seems to be going very well. And they're, they're probably going to be producing ahead of um, guidance uh, in the next for the next sort of three months is the forecast. So that's that was pretty pleasing. Um, last couple of non-producers, 
uh, Cardinal came out with their last, the long awaited sort of feasibility study sort of didn't, I guess, didn't meet expectations for me. Um, one thing that uh, the, the well, again, when you read something like this, you look at it and you sort of say, where's the, where's the cost forecast number? So I was reading this sort of on my phone and I couldn't, couldn't find it. And then, you know, it's buried in here is the all in sustaining cost number. And that, that sort of frustrates me. And again, it shows you they're sort of hiding bad information in the, in the text. Um, I would like to see it in the first, it really should be in these first three lines. It should have the all in sustaining cost figure for the life of mine. Uh, and the reason they're showing it there is because it's, you know, it's increased substantially over the PFS number over 125, 125 bucks an ounce there. It's increased which puts them, you know, from the the lowest quartile of the cost curve down to sort of in toward the middle, um, and that's that's kind of it's still a not a, it's still not a bad project. I actually got the off the World Gold Council website. You can get the the quarterly all in sustaining cost curve, and you can see they're at eight ninety five an ounce. They're probably in about here somewhere. They're still probably in the sort of forty to fifty percent range on the cost curve. Um, which means they're still a good project, uh, particularly on a long life. You know, gradually this cost curve is going to move up over time. Um, the projects that are at a 900 cost, 900 US dollars now or in the next few years, and they're still producing in 10 or 15 years, this cost curve will gradually move up. So they're going to be probably move toward that lowest third of the cost curve over time. So that's that's a good project. I don't expect it to get built. Um, obviously, Cardinal share price hasn't didn't really like the news that well. I think a few people got um, were not that impressed with the numbers. It, the market had probably been forecasting it as well uh, that it was going to come in at a relatively high cost. I sold a few, probably quarter of my shares, because I was kind of I think now there's a there's a danger that they're going to sit in this kind of um, stasis for a while where they they can't they can't finance this mine on their own. I don't think that there's too too much dilution required. I think if they have to get a debt deal that's not really to their liking, it's it's not, it, the, the directors won't accept that. So there's a danger that they kind of sit there for a while waiting for a takeover, waiting for the gold price to go up or waiting for a joint venture announcement, which I th still think is the most uh, attractive option and the most likely, but uh, I don't want to, I don't want to wait for that opportunity, wait for that to come, even though I think it might, uh, I'm, I'm happier to, to, um, to just sell and hold a more comfortable position and not be overexposed in my portfolio. So I, you know, I still think it's a relatively good project, um, but you know, it doesn't have that the lowest lower cost numbers that I'd hoped for, and that that really sort of. But it's at a at a fifteen hundred dollar gold price, it, it should get built by someone. Uh, at the moment, the market doesn't really there's not a lot of attention to the stock in general. Like it's still only trading a few hundred grand a day, so. Um, you know, I think in this gold price environment, this project should get bought out, but you know, there's a danger it just sits there for a while. So I'm, I had to lower my position there, but I still think the, the company's got good prospects here in a rising gold price environment. Final stock, uh, West African Resources, again doing pretty, had a pretty good um, result on Friday, back up above that sort of mini mini resistance level there. I think this is should run again. Um, but you know, I think they're they're gradually uh, improving their the mine at um, San Brado are building it. I think they're up to about 75% construction complete now as well. So I think I read that they're forecasting now first gold production before uh, end of June next year. So that's a little bit ahead of forecasts, and I'm hoping that they can um, we can see some positive news about cost forecasts and for extra drilling results in the next sort of three months as well. So I'm happy to own that again. It's still uh, it's one of my largest holdings still, so I'm, I'm pretty happy there and just sit tight waiting for uh, production to, to come online. So I think that's where I've um, what I've been looking at the last few weeks. Uh, those quarterly reports do set little set trends for a while. Um, it, I'd, if you're really interested in stuff, I'd, I'd you know, look at reading and um, listening to analysts on the uh, quarterly conference calls is always a good good thing uh, you can learn quite a bit from there and, and understand what the what the market's focusing on because um, sometimes when you, you read these reports you're not sure what what matters and the analysts the analysts are setting the tone um, particularly you know so that the day after reports you see a day after a quarterly is released the analysts will update their cost for their their um, 
price targets and, and everything like that. So that's still still set is a quite important thing in the market and sets trends. A lot of people don't don't know what if it's a good number or not, so they're waiting on the analyst to really to show that. So um, yeah, reading those reports is something I, I, I focus a lot on, uh, and that's been doing that for the last few years. So um, you can definitely get a lot of extra info out of there. And I'll probably do another video in a few weeks if there's any any new developments among the uh, the stocks that I follow. Thanks a lot.